How's it going everybody? Cello Ben here. Welcome back to another video and today we're going to talk about how to make playing this incredibly tough concerto a little bit easier. So this is Haydn's second cello concerto and it's the, the D major concerto. And let me just show you a picture really quickly. This is going to sound totally out of left field but I promise it's relevant. But if you're squeamish or don't like seeing kind of disturbing pictures, maybe avert your eyes for 10 seconds. This is a naked mole rat. Why am I displaying a naked mole rat? Well, because that's how I feel when I play this piece. Just nowhere to hide, completely exposed to everything. And that makes it ever more important to solidify some things about this piece as you're preparing it. Because if you're learning this with the intention of at some point playing it for somebody else, it's one of those pieces where it feels way different in the practice room than it does on a stage or in an audition room or in a lesson or whatever. One thing about Haydn D is it's so important to start off on the right foot. And I like to think of breathing with the bow, which sounds kind of out there, but just roll with me for a second on this. I promise you it makes sense. That is, I like to take a big inhale before I'm starting, and that inhale happens in the bow too and then I exhale with the bow for the first note. And that is the first step in helping me feel grounded with this. I started on third finger on the A string actually, and then do a finger replacement to one because it's another thing that helps me feel secure to start that on three. But if you wanna just do one the whole time or whatever, that's fine too. As you may have heard, I faltered just a little bit on that note. It didn't feel completely secure. So this is one of those times when I like doing a finger replacement, which can be a little bit risky, but I think it's worth it in this case. One of the really important things in this piece is cleanliness. And with that being said, that means that we can have some trouble getting to this B correctly, because it's not the kind of thing where we can just tap it and test it, because that's going to really interrupt things. Not great. So, one thing is just memorize where that B is. from the air practice is very necessary there. I like to keep this feeling of openness and breathing in general throughout this piece. I mean, it's important in general in cello playing, but it helps some of the really scary stuff feel a little bit less so. So for example here, I'm using a lot of bow and I'm not being afraid to change bows sometimes. I'm not trying to fit too much stuff under a slur. This is another spot that's really important to get the tuning right because you're up in this sort of, I like to think of it as almost like an uncanny valley of the cello where it's easy to be in that little crack of am I in tune, am I not in tune. So really solidifying that here is important. Now the other thing you may have noticed is that I'm not exactly in rhythm necessarily beat by beat. I don't remember who gave me this suggestion, but when I work on Haydn D with a metronome, I do it actually at the half note. And I put the half note at 29. It may be a little bit slower than some people like, but it lets me have a little bit of time to play around with things, but still within a metric structure. It's almost like if you're doing a, a Bach Alamon. There's so much going on within those beats that you can both be well in the meter and you can also have a little fun with it. Another reason that I'm using a good bit of bow here is to avoid pressing. Um, this is something that needs to project, of course, because it is a concerto. But if you approach it like this, it gets a little bit too uh, Shostakovich-y, maybe. So instead, I like, this is again, the bow is breathing, it's taking deep breaths. One last 
thing in this part, that trill there can be dicey. Um, and I think you don't have to overdo it because the way I just did it, it made it so there's sort of some hiccups in the line because it's like, where does my trill end and my next thing begin? I like to just add one or two turns. And then those separate bows at the end for the flare. You can do two like a... Like I said, one or two, maybe three. But not too many that you lose control of what's trill and what's not. One thing that always sort of freaked me out a little bit in auditions was this. And I think it might have to do with the fact that I was starting at up bow. And I think it generally is the convention to start at up bow. But I've actually found that in a high pressure situation it's easier to start down bow and then add an extra bow on here. And I think it can be made to work. It's not exactly orthodox, but I like it. I think it's okay to have a little bit of a tenuto on this, this D here. So. And it works, I think, to, to start that down and then go from there. You could, like I said, correcting your, your direction with the extra bow on that C sharp. Now, like I said, you don't want to be tapping the string to find that B towards the beginning, but sometimes I think a little bit of finger articulation can be really helpful in this piece. And I'll show you where. Right here. Um, I don't think it should be too intense, but I actually wrote in my music once when I was preparing this and I was kind of figuring out how to make it pop. I literally wrote in tappy tappy. So if you add a little bit of the tappy tappy in there, I think it can, can help the line come out and be more vibrant. Now let's talk about these like shifts slash reaches we have here. And these are tough. So one thing that I think it's important to do is to, for this first one, go up on one first. Get your hand position set. And you can go to two here on this harmonic. And then just replace it with three and do the, do the tappy tappy. Same goes here. I might have exaggerated it a little bit, but these uh, French shifts or old finger shifts, I think can be really helpful in making sure that things are just feeling a little bit more rock solid. Because again, this whole piece, if you're not careful and you don't, you know, find some tricks to help yourself with it, it's going to feel like you're just walking a tightrope the whole time. And that's the exact opposite of what you want in an audition or performance or anything. There are a few things to be extra careful of in this passage here. One is, of course, the intonation, because you're going from a major sixth to a perfect fourth. Of course, perfect fourths are just maybe the most nightmarish interval to tune. So you've got to be extra careful on that. But I also think that you don't want to put too much bow weight onto the D string here. The melody is on the top line and you want to make sure that you bring that out. Other thing to be careful of, this gesture can often drag. So this is one of those spots that you want to be extra careful to visit with the metronome. You can still be expressive and you can still make the shift happen within the confines of the meter. And last thing for here, 
I like to be a little bit cute with this. Stay way out at the tip of the bow and do separate bows for ya ba 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 ba. Okay, let's go on. This passage really likes to rush. <laughs> extreme there but what I'm doing is I'm number one using the phrasing to help me stay in rhythm that is I'm trying to make it a little bit interesting musically and as I do that it's helping me not rush but second of all I'm not being afraid to do a little bit of tenuto on important notes um, not to the point that it's gonna really stick out but just to the point that it helps me be a little bit more grounded grounded and solid basically are the keywords of this video because they're what feel like the antithesis to this piece, but what you need to incorporate into yourself if you're going to be successful with it. Speaking of musically interesting, I mean everything should be musically interesting, but especially something like this needs to have some well thought out contrast in it. If you just do this, it, it's basically lifeless. So. Think about the line and think about where it's going and how you can maybe even vary your stroke. So I got a little bit more capricious with the stroke towards the bottom, a little bit shorter, a little bit chunkier maybe. And I also did a little bit of a diminuendo because I have a long way to go now. So I'm going more on, in, in my case, as I go up. Um, but exactly how you do it is up to you. The important thing is that you show that you've thought about it, that you've considered it carefully, that you've thought about the, the musical implications. Somewhere like here is another place that's really important to make it extra interesting, because you've got repeating stuff. So you could do a number of things. You could do an echo. I actually like to do sort of a diminuendo and a, a loosening of the stroke as I go through this whole passage. And that helps me add a little bit of nice contrast to it. Now, once I'm back up here, I'm fully back on the string and very exuberant. This is like the top of the line. Now, there are a lot of various things that you can do here. For example, some people do this. Some people do. Or some people do. acceptable and it's all about your risk tolerance. However, if you want to write sort of your own little flourish, feel free, just don't go too out there. Now speaking of this passage, especially if you're going up to that high E, take your time. You have more time than you think, I promise, and you've got to nail that note. This is something that was really emphasized to me in, in lessons in my past. Now, I'm sure when I'm editing this, or when you watch this, you'll think, oh, that was beautifully in time, but it felt like an eternity here. So that's one of those perceptual, perceptual, perceptional, perception-related things to get, uh, to wrap your head around. Okay, second theme. You have options here. That's one. G for this. Um, I think it gives a nice color and it also helps the continuity of the line. Even in audition settings where I'm just playing the exposition, I don't bother with adding a turn here. I just do. 
If I'm playing the whole movement, I wait and I add the turn in the recapitulation. Especially with how dicey it can feel going up the G string, it's important to set some anchor points, and I try to do that in the most musical way I can. So this F sharp... is an important anchor point. So I do a little crescendo up to it, and then I do a little bit of a tenuto on it. And then a little bit here. It helps me stay in rhythm, it helps me stay grounded. Again, grounded, 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 solid, solid, solid. Super important throughout all of this. Also, when we get to the A down here, I take a pretty long tenuto there. It's prone to rush on the arpeggio up, and I think also musically it's nice. Let's hear that tenuto in context. And now here we have a bit of a contrast, I think, because we're an octave up, and we have, I think, definitely a turn this time. That can be a little bit lighter and more open, but both octaves, the bow should always be moving generously. triplets can both drag and rush and in my experience it depends on where in the piece you are so there are some parts when I've had to write in my music don't rush some parts where I've had to write don't drag so metronome practice especially on this part is critical to really do a lot of but let's also go a little bit past the left hand stuff that we already know is so tricky and talk about how the bow can help us ease our way a little bit take a look at how my bow travels so what you saw is I went out towards the tip. I actually find it easier to control out at the tip, especially here. When I'm going down here all the way to the C string, at least this is the fingering I do. And then here, I get back towards the frog. So to summarize this passage, what you need to do is really pay attention to where you are in the bow. Also deal well with dynamics because there's a lot of repeated stuff. I like to do an echo and then a crescendo up. But then, as you're going up, crawl your way out gently to the tip of the bow. So, of course the other thing with that passage, and so much else in this piece, is intonation. You've just got to woodshed the intonation with drones, tuners, recording yourself, listening carefully, all that stuff. Because like I said, naked mole rat, everything is exposed. But if you have that baseline of intonation that you know is as close to infallible as possible, and you can just put your fingers exactly where they need to go, the rest of the stuff is going to come much more easily. Now, I know that's a lot easier said than done, and I'm not going to pretend that I've ever completely gotten to that point, but this is the kind of thing that I strive for when I'm working on it, so that everything just rings.
Anyway, back to where we were. It's important to anchor yourself here because this is another place where you have more time than you think and it's prone to rushing. So be careful there too. Okay, similar principles apply going forward in the... So let's go to where we change. So, I'm happy with how that turned out, but it took me a lot of trial and error with those tenths at the top to figure out what was wrong, why I couldn't do them consistently. And I finally realized that it was more in the bow than anything else, because I had, you know, I learned this piece about 10 years ago, and then ever since, whenever I've had to take it back out for anything, I've had to woodshed those tenths a lot. So by now, I'm happy to say that they're pretty well into my fingers. But the controlling of the bow ended up being my sort of Achilles heel, Achilles bow, whatever. <laughs> so these actually, I think, are better suited to being out at the tip. And with a little bit of tenuto at the first top note of each one, so bum wa da di da da dum wa da di da da dum wa da di da 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 dum, and maybe each tenuto increasing in intensity a little bit each time for the line. Let's talk about the closing. components that are extra important to get right for this. Number one is as relaxed of a left hand as possible. That's actually global throughout this and I think anything else because it helps you adjust minor intonation things when they come up if your hand is relaxed and can just quickly fix its position to where it needs to be. Um, but it also in something like this helps you move between things more smoothly. So for fingering, I like to do and then 2-2 two, two, and then it makes it easier to access this. And kind of like what I was talking about before with this is one of those parts where I think it's important to keep most of the focus on the A string because that's where the melody is. And it's quite simple actually. So the bottom note is just for color and support. It's also important to do a really good contrast between the two iterations of this. Um, the first should be quite sostenuto, I think, and the second, if you look at a lot of editions, you'll see eighths instead of quarters, and I think that's a very valid way to go about this. And then right here, I like to just start a little bit capriciously and intensify as I go along, and that basically brings us to the end of the exposition. Now the intention of this was to be a relatively short video that just covers the exposition, because that's sort of the main place that a lot of people need for auditions and things like that. But of course there's difficult stuff in the entirety of the first movement, so if a lot of people I find are struggling with that and they want to see coverage of the entire movement, please do let me know in the comments. So before we say goodbye for now, I want to sort of go over what we talked about, at least in the broad strokes. First one, breathing. Got to keep the lungs open. And in a lot of cases, you want that to go with the bow. But regardless, always be breathing. Well, you will be breathing. Always be breathing consciously and deeply and well. Intonation. Wood shedding cannot be overstated. Don't hurt yourself, but get it to the point where it's very difficult for you to miss a note. Again. Easier said than done. I'm not going to claim that I've gotten to that peak yet, but it's a good goal. Number three, style. Play with some flair, but also with 
an acknowledgement of the fact that this is of the classical style, and relatively early classical style. Make sure that you make it interesting by making contrasts where it's appropriate, and use different bowings to your advantage to help you feel more grounded. Now, did I cover every single thing that's needed to make a great performance of Haydn D happen? Of course not. But, I'm sure that I have some other things up here that I can help with on this piece, so if you have any particular questions about the piece or any passages that you're struggling with, just let me know in the comments and I will do my very best to help you out. Also, if you're in need of a teacher, get in touch because the Cello Ben Studio is now open for Zoom lessons all around the world. I would love to speak with you about that if you're interested. Just go down to the description and click on the link for a free trial lesson. Or if you want to learn at your own pace, head over to celloben.com course where you can sign up for my course on Udemy. If you enjoyed this, I would very much appreciate a like and a sub, and maybe even a share if you're feeling super generous. But other than that, I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.